Um, I have the, the task today of coming in and um, talking to you about something which hopefully you already know about. Um, so if we've done our job over the last couple of months, um, hopefully a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today you're already familiar with. But what I, what I plan to go through and, and, go and, and review, I guess, is just discuss the, the review that was conducted that Carl talked about and a lot of you participated in towards the end of 2014 um, to do with the, the review of the selection indexes which are calculated within Andy's free plan. Um, I'd then like to go through and spend some time talking about the, the new indexes, if you like, those that we implemented in December. And importantly, spend quite a bit of time at the end going through and, and talking about some of the considerations that I think you need to have when you're looking at the new indexes and, and using them within your breeding programs. So uh, we'll go through, go through this, and as I say, hopefully um, a lot of this you will have already seen in, in some of the documents and the, the communications we've done since the implementation of these indexes uh, towards the end of last year. Um, I will also say, I suppose, if anyone's got any questions as we go along, then um, please feel free to, to interrupt and, and we can cover them off at the time rather than wait till the end. So, to, just to, to kick us off, um, if we start off where we were, um, this time on September last year, uh, when I just come into the role with Emerson Australia, is we want to go through and do a, a review of the indexes that are calculated within Emerson's free plan. And central to that, and it really focused around that, was to undertake quite a comprehensive consultation process with the industry. So that was the, the key that we really wanted to, to focus on, was to go out and talk to the members of Angus Australia, and talk to, to other people within the industry, and get their feedback on what they'd like to see the breed direction for the Angus breed going forward, and therefore how we could design the selection indexes around that. So that had, had a number of different components. Uh, from the, the, the workshops which we ran. So we ran nine workshops uh, around the countryside and, and a lot of you attended those. We also, for those that couldn't get to the workshops, conducted a, an online survey uh, and that had, had quite a good response. Um, and also did some, some individual as well as targeted consultation with different people uh, throughout the beef supply chain. So talking to, to researchers, to feed lots of processes um, about what they want to see from this cattle um, going forward, and where they'd like to see you as breeders start to, to target within your breeding programs. There was also through the workshops and, and the surveys quite a lot of feedback from senior companies and, and private consultants and commercial producers uh, who came along. So, this uh, review process, just to give you a bit more background, I suppose, these are some of the, the faces of um, people who are out and about. Um, some of the people that are in the audience uh, today are, are on that, that screen. Obviously, I've done a good job in only selecting the good looking ones to put up there. So, um, out of interest, um, is, uh, it was around 300 English breeders uh, who provided us feedback through this review period. So, that was around the, the workshops of about 150 people, and then also another 150 people provided feedback uh, through the, the survey. And importantly, that was uh, across the country. So, it was across all, all states. Um, Interestingly for me, that is going around through this process was the feedback in terms of breeding directions for the Angus breed was fairly consistent, irrespective of where we were. So there were a few little local issues in different workshops, but uh, generally the, the industry was quite united in, in where they wanted to see the Angus breed go, irrespective of where they were based. Um, while we had 300 people provide feedback, we also collected information about the number of um, females they had within their herds, and also the number of bulls that they were selling annually. So across those 300 people, um, they actually represented over 100, or around 105,000 kind of females within their breeding herds, and that was accounting for about 17,500 bull sales annually. So we were quite comfortable and we were quite happy with that, being that we think we got to people who had a, a significant skin in the game. So there's a lot of people in there that really were contributing a lot to the Angus breed and hopefully we've got feedback from, from the people who are driving the breed going forward. So once we got to do the, the review process, that was, um, that was the central to, to the whole review of the indexes. That was probably the easy part though, just going out and, and listening to people and collating their feedback. Once we'd done that, we then were with the task of actually doing the work of, of going through and identifying what, what, what changes or things that we need to do to the selection indexes that are calculated. So 
place for that feedback to, to give you an idea of the process. Um, we came back to the office and, and went through and, and revised some selection indexes, and that was predominantly led by, by Carl, who's our redevelopment manager. Those drafts, that we then, once we had those draft selection indexes, then took them back to industry for consultation and feedback. So the first part of that was to get review from the, the redevelopment committee, uh, who are the part of the, the ex Australian board who are responsible for, for upcoming developments. So they, re they reviewed them. We also went out and did some, some consultation with members. Uh, so we did some one on one uh, actual kind of um, consultation over the internet with uh, four influential members and four quite large Angus members, and also conducted a, a webinar for, for all members. So everybody had the opportunity to provide feedback on those draft indexes that had, that had been developed. And that was a, quite a um, successful kind of process as well. We got some, some really good comments and ideas out of that. Resulting from that, we went back and made some further revisions, so some, some tweaks and some fine tuning, um, and basically developed the, the final indexes, which were the ones that were implemented in December uh, 2014. So that was the, the process that we, we went through. And as you said, I think it's, it's quite a, a comprehensive process, um, and hopefully everybody feels that they've had the opportunity to, to have input into that. Um, obviously, it might be some people with the actual indexes went exactly with what they were thinking, but this is really after a consensus view and um, I'm comfortable so far that we might have achieved that. Um, so what's, what's happened when we move into now the, the new indexes? I guess yeah, a starting point, we were standing here this time last year, is there were four different indexes being calculated within the MS3 plan. So we had our, our long fed CAAB index, our heavy grass fed steer, our short fed domestic and our terminal indexes. And now when we look at animals, we have four completely new indexes, uh, being the Angus breeding index, the domestic index, the heavy grain, and the heavy grass index. Obviously, most of you would be familiar with those, actually receiving those on your animals. So we'll spend some time now just going through it and outlining probably the major revisions, if you like, or the major changes which were implemented into the indexes. Um, so the first thing to note is, as part of the review of the indexes, all the economic and production parameters which are used in the calculation of indexes were completely updated. So the Angus indexes all use a bit of software called Breed Object, which has been developed by the Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit at um, the Yamada up here. Um, so that software relies on the, the, I guess the Breed Society putting in a, a range of things which describe the production system, describe the economics within it, to then go through and, and calculate what different weightings on MBV should on and put in the calculation of the index. So what's well, central to this process was, was updating all those economic and production parameters. For those that attended the workshops, you may have noticed or um, remembered that we went through and talked about there would have been a new version of software um, which we were hoping was going to be available for these indexes. In the end, and I'll, I'll finish up on this talk about where we're going forward, we ended up remaining with the, the current version of Breed Object software. So we did have a look at the, the new version. We had some concerns about um, or some, some questions or things we'd like to see before we went to implementation. So we, we remain in the same software, we just updated all the parameters we did. Um, so the changes, if you like, if we, if we look at the short fed domestic index that did exist, that's now, I guess, it's been replaced by the domestic index. Um, the reason for that change, I guess, is we were getting um, feedback from people that there wasn't necessarily a short fed system, so the domestic index now is, is designed and came from people who are either finishing off grass, finishing with a, a short 50 to 70 day grain feed period, or just a kind of grain cyst in the paddock time period. So the, the same index trying to cope with, with all production systems in that domestic market. Um, it was a slightly heavier weight, so I think the existing short fed index was a 245 kilo carcass weight. That moved up to, to 270 day, uh, kilos and from 15 to 16 months at, at turn off. So again, based on the feedback that we had, it was deemed that that was more appropriate for that market. And one of the big changes which has occurred across all our indexes was an increased emphasis on the impact. So with some of the, the feedback that we're getting now with MSA and the, the different programs and premiums which are coming in, there was consistent feedback across the country about trying to put some focus on the air quality traits in the indexes targeted at the domestic index. Domestic industry. So they were the, the major changes against the short fed um, being replaced by the domestic. The heavy grass fed steer is effectively known as the heavy grass index.
Index. Um, it was the index which, which probably changed the least, I think, from memory. Um, again, it was a slightly heavier weight, so I think it's gone from 320 kilos endpoint uh, carcass weight to 340 kilos, uh, but still at 22 months of age. And similarly to the domestic index, inclusion on, um, or some emphasis on any quality traits within that index. Uh, within the, the long fed CWAB index, um, it's now effectively been replaced by the, the heavy grain index, um, so they, they line up fairly closely. There were some changes to, to reflect what had happened, there were changes in the feedlot industry, so the days on feed, uh, for memory it was 270 days, that's now moved out back to about 200 days on feed. Um, there's a slightly heavier carcass now, um, but again under age of turn off. So I think it was out at 27 months or 26 months, and it's now back at, at 24 months. And we went through and updated the marmalade premiums, which are really good. So obviously within that index, the marmalade premiums play quite a, a big, um, have a big input in that index. So we went through and talked to the processors and particularly updated those, um, those marmalade premiums, which on reflection, we're, we're pretty close to the mark in the existing index, but there was just a little bit of tweaking. Uh, the terminal index um, was the, is obviously no longer being produced. Uh, I guess the, the major driver behind that was the feedback we were getting from people was that the terminal index, um, people were, while well, there's still a, a terminal program going on in the north, people were now more using Angus genetics just to infuse into their program and retaining females that had some Angus content. So, it was the, the terminal thing was the index wasn't really relevant, and I've said it, it's no longer produced. I guess it's really been replaced by the Angus breeding index, which, which we'll talk about in a second. So, the, while it's no longer a, a northern specific um, index, it's really been replaced by the, the, the Angus breeding index, which is a bit more of an all purpose index. So, that was one of the, the big changes which we've seen, as, as well as having the, the kind of productions and, and market um, endpoint specific indexes was this implementation of the new Angus breeding index. And that was enabled by the fact that the differences between the production systems were not nearly as, as stark as what they were before. So the inclusion of the feed quality into the domestic indexes, the, the shortening of the days on feed in the long feed index, the actual traits which were influencing the different indexes and the different product, um, profit drivers within the different systems came a lot closer together than what they were previously. So it's enabled to to embark on this new Angus breeding index. The other major change which was made um, was, the, was based on feedback that we had about the different kind of breed averages between the different indexes. So in particular, the, the long feed index um, had a higher average, and so most animals had a higher long feed index than, than the others, um, purely in the magnitude of the actual index value, and that was a concern for a lot of people, with a lot of people thinking that that was resulting in people selecting on the long feed index didn't really reflect their production system. So as you will have seen, the, the breed averages have now all been adjusted, so that all the indexes have an average of 100 and everything's around that. Now having said that, we started with the design of 100, and as you will have seen from the different monthly runs, it's bouncing around a little bit, the, the dollar either there um, around it, but the aim is to have that around 100, or at least have a constant breed average. Right, so they were, the, they were the major revisions. Um, so the new indexes, I guess, that we, we now have, um, uh, the four of them, and you can see the, the description of those. Um, obviously, the three indexes which are specific to a different production system, um, or a particular production system market endpoint. And the Angus Breed Index, which is kind of this, this all-purpose index, or general-purpose index, which aims to kind of identify animals that will improve the, the overall profitability in the majority of production systems. So it's kind of a big, per I guess, big purpose or all purpose type index. And we also have the, the, other, the other three there. Um, so the domestic index, as I've talked about, steers being finished on, on either pasture, um, grain assist or grain, short grain feed periods, for a 270 carcass at 16 months of age, and some emphasis on, on eating quality traits. I should say all the indexes, of course, are now self-replacing indexes, so they have all have emphasis some of the maternal traits. Uh, the heavy grain index being um, the 200 day feedlot finishing period, 420 kilos at 24 months of age, and we're significant premiums uh, for marbling. The heavy grass feed index being uh, 
uh, steers being finished on grass at 22 months of age at 340 kilo carcass weight with some kind of air quality emphasis in there. So we have each of the, the four indexes and hopefully that suits the major production systems for which um, Angus animals have been used in now. I, could, I, I thought when I was putting this presentation together to, uh, about whether I'd go through now and start to talk to you about the different emphasis which is put in each of the different EBVs and the different kind of profit drivers and the, the objective traits and things that, that are really targeted within these indexes. And I've chosen not to. All that information, if you want, is, is, is sheets at the back of the room, uh, which has all that in there. But I thought it better to focus on just what, if you select on the index, what's it going to do within your breeding program? So not actually necessarily look at how the indexes are made up, but look at if it's in line with where we were trying to look at what the breeding direction is for the breed, what these indexes are trying to do. So to do that, um, this is a, a graph which you, you may have seen in some of the documentation we've sent out. But it, it, it attempts to outline or demonstrate to you, if you select on this index, what changes in traits are you likely to see within your breeding program. So just to explain this, we've had the, the different traits across the bottom. And we had the, the relative change, if you like, um, or the expected change in each of the traits if you select on this index. And for those who want to really understand what this is, this effectively looks at, at the published size, or the size which have been used in the last couple of years within the breed, ranks them on the index, and selects the top 10% for use within the breeding program. And it looks at what's the average EBVs of the, the top 10% versus the average of all the size, and then if we select those as a size, what direction will it take? We've converted all the units into kind of standard deviation units, so it just shows you what the, so we can compare effectively the, the traits together because they're all in different units, but if you put them in standard deviation, it standardises it. So what you can see the Angus breeding index is attempting to do, in terms of, I guess this is very consistent with the, the breeding direction kind of feedback that we got through that consultation phase, is to improve carbon needs, while a slight reduction in birth weight, basically high on birth weight constant, Increasing putting extra growth into our cattle, or ideally for an, an early rate of turnoff. While moderating mature cow weight, and I'll come back and talk about that a little bit. Under these indexes, mature cow weight or mature cow size in our female herds will increase a little bit. Um, increase the milk, increase fertility, um, so by decreasing the dose of carbon, increase the, the fertility of our, our female herd. And from a carcass side of things, increase carcass weight, increase your muscle area. Put a little bit of fat into the system, but not too much. So basically, keep fat where it is, or, or just make sure it doesn't go backwards. Is, is obviously what the index is trying to do. And put some inch marks for the fat in there to keep improving our air quality in our marble. And I should say, yield, while putting some fat in, making sure it's not compromising our yield, and the yield is, is continuing to increase at the same time. So, does that make sense to your We're going to talk about this some of the other indexes going forward, but is that, that clear as to what the index is trying to do? So it's well, the, the interpretation of that. So basically what we're trying to do was fit a, a balanced type of approach whereby um, the response to selection or the change of traits within our breeding program is kind of balanced across our, our female traits, our growth traits, um, and our, our carcass type of traits to end up with more profitable animals at the end. The one part of this, and I'll come back to it, which wasn't really consistent with the, the feedback that we got was to do with mature cow weight. So I think the overwhelming feedback from, from industry was that they didn't want to see Angus cows getting any better. We've tried to design the index around that, but unfortunately it wasn't possible to achieve it without compromising in other areas. So I want to talk about what that means in a lot more detail in, in a little while. Um, but really, of all those traits, the only one that wasn't necessarily consistent with, with where people wanted it to go was this mature cow weight. Um, we can also put some numbers around that graph. Um, so you'll see some of the documentation which we've put out. Um, we've actually given you the, the expected response after one generation. So if you select on this index, um, what, would, what may happen within your breeding program after one generation? And you can see it's very consistent with this. Improvement in carbon needs, improvement in growth, mature cow weight does creep up um, a little bit, and some improvement in, in the kind of carcass area. 
So we have that same information uh, for, for each of the different indexes. So if I replace the index breeding index now, move to the domestic index, you see the expected response is, is quite similar. However, there are some, some slightly different, or some subtle differences, I suppose we should say. Um, so there's a little bit more emphasis on carbon needs within the domestic index, uh, and slightly more emphasis on, on yield. Also, the two cow weight is actually being moderated a little bit more. So um, we have been able to, to keep that so it's not increasing as much within the domestic index. Otherwise, however, across the, the general kind of across the trades, it's, it's very uh, kind of uh, similar. The heavy grain index, you see again, is, is fairly um, similar, but there is the, the extra emphasis on, on a marble or IMF within that index. So um, it's slightly less on the growth and, and yield than, than the other indexes. Um, so there is more of a focus in that index on those, those traits of importance of that production system. And likewise, in the heavy grain index, um, it's probably the most different, I guess, to the heavy grass index. Uh, sorry, heavy grass is most different to heavy grain. Um, obviously not quite as much IMF, allowing yields and the fat. There's a bit more fat in there probably than the other systems, so under the, the grass finished area. Um, and, and mature cow oil also um, increases a little bit more than, say, the So they're the, the four different indexes, um, and obviously all that information plus um, information about what the, the profit drivers are or the, the key kind of traits within the breeding objective, and also the, the different EBV weightings are, are all included in the EBV stand at the back if um, anyone has already got those. So it's interested in looking at this in a bit more detail. Uh, to kind of um, keep going down finish off is I want to spend some time really talking about not the indexes themselves, but some considerations when using these indexes within your breeding program. And this, I guess, these, these next couple of slides really try and uh, discuss some of the, the major issues which were um, raised about the indexes when we were going around and doing that industry consultation last year. So some of the, the key considerations are, that I want to put in front of you when, when looking at or considering using selection indexes to assist you with the selection of animals within the breeding program. First of all, I really want to focus on this, that, that the selection indexes don't run your breeding programs. And we had a, a lot of feedback um, from people that indicated probably that they do. But I, I really want to stress to you that while the selection indexes are there to assist you and, and provide a tool to, to help you select your animals, ultimately you are responsible for running your breeding program and you need to make sure it's going in the direction that you're comfortable with. Hopefully the indexes are fairly consistent with that, but if they're not, then we need to start looking at what alternatives might exist. So the selection indexes, while they're a tool when we put them out there, they still don't change the key elements which are going to determine whether your breeding program is successful. So those kind of things being, you need to carefully plan what you're doing within your breeding program, using good information to assist you with the selection of animals to use within that breeding program, and probably importantly out of all of them, maintaining some kind of consistency and patience in the pursuit of your breeding goals. So some kind of long-term vision um, as to where you're going in the breeding program. And really, before you start looking at the selection index, it's having a really clear idea of what you want to do in your breeding program. Where you want to take it, what breeding direction you want to have, and what changes you want to make, and what genetic improvement you want to make within your breeding program. The next point in here I really want to stress is to ensure that when you're using selection indexes, that you identify selection indexes which is relevant to what you're trying to do or what you're trying to breed cattle to do. So I guess this comes back to the ultimate feedback which we had a lot of last year that there was a perception, um, and possibly quite real, that there was an overemphasis or over selection on the long feed index, even though there was a lot of people using the long feed index to, I guess, select breeding programs and production systems which weren't targeted at that market. So targeted at the domestic, index, or the domestic market or, or the heavy grass kind of markets, using the, the long feed index to do that. So really, hopefully, um, the, the, the key point when you look at those indexes is to make sure that you're selecting on index which is relevant to either what you're trying to do in your breeding program or what your clients are trying to do and who you're trying to breed bulls for. Importantly, if none of those indexes are suitable, then we do have options to establish a customised index for you. So you 
talk to Carl or I about that. If none of these four indexes that you're looking at look suitable to you, then we can get some, start some discussion about setting up an index which is specific to your kind of breeding goals. I guess the, the counter to that is with the introduction of the Angus breeding index, we are now trying to get a more general purpose index that, that might hopefully suit most, most production systems. So, so hopefully it's... Um, it's the, the end result that there might be, if people aren't comfortable with any of those individual ones, that the end is breeding index might be suitable for you before we start talking about the custom index. I want to spend some time now talking about the importance when you select your index of still considering individual EBVs. So, um, and I, know, I think that was a, uh, a lot of feedback which, which we got through the index was people were really focused on the index as being there, but had a perception that if you were selecting on the index, you didn't need to worry about the individual EBVs of the animal for the individual traits. So I want to show you some examples here to, to try and, I guess, counter that and, and stress to you that while you're using the index, it's still important to pay attention or some attention to the key individual EBVs for, for really important traits within your breeding program. So within here, um, the Angus breeding index. Here I have two different sizes that are just thrown off the web yesterday. So there's the sizes which have been used. They have the same overall Angus breeding index, and they're, they're above breed average and considerably so, but they are totally different genetic packages. So what the index is saying is, well, overall they're going to be just as, exactly the same profitability within your production system, but they're going to deliver that in, in different ways. So by that, obviously, the, the top ball is, is quite a, a high growth ball, but not so superior in carving ease, whereas the bottom ball is, is quite superior in carving ease, but doesn't have the same growth. And they, they're totally different genetic packages, obviously totally different mature cow styles, um, and we get out here in the carcass traits and just focus on things like marbling, things like fat, um, things like muscle. Big differences in the individual traits. So while you can use the index, you still need to be making sure that for the individual traits, they're putting the genetics into your program that you're comfortable with. Likewise, within the Angus breeding index, here we've got animals with extreme EBVs for economically important traits are going to index highly no matter how we set up the index. So here we have a bull that's it's quite extreme for growth and it comes up with quite a, a high index. It's, it's one of the highest in the breed. But you might have, in some areas, traits which people aren't comfortable with or don't believe is suitable for use within their breeding program. So the fact that there's high indexing doesn't necessarily mean it'll be suitable, say, for use in a, a breeding program targeting heifers or, or in the different individual traits if you're trying to put some fat into your system, etc. So these are the things that, that you need to be aware of that, that animals are going to index highly if they're so extreme with some of these favourable traits. And you're making sure that you're paying attention to the individual EBVs to make sure they've got the right genetics for those traits. And how do we get around it? Well, we, we can do it by setting some kind of acceptable EBV ranges for those particular traits. So we rank them on the index, but if they're not in the right area for those individual traits, then we don't consider them for selection. I just want to demonstrate that a little bit more. If you consider our Angus breeding index here, one of the concerns you'll remember I said when we put these indexes together was this increase in mature cow weight and not being consistent with, with what people were saying. I've gone through and looked at this exact same analysis, but rather than just ranking on Angus breeding index, I've also gone through and excluded animals if they were in the heaviest 1% of the breed for mature cow weight. So just by taking that simple step of, getting, of excluding animals of the size that were in the highest 1%, you can see the change that that has on our expected response to selection. So particularly with mature cow weight, we've now made some compromises in other traits, so we're not going to get as much growth and, and um, some individual other changes. But mature cow weight now has been held fairly, fairly constant versus increasing up there. So just by putting out simple independent kind of criteria or individual traits, you can influence that response quite considerably. Likewise, if we put too much emphasis on the individual trait, we can actually screw it up quite a bit. So just by going through in that same analysis, but excluding animals if that size that were in the heaviest 20% for mature cow weight, 
then we start to compromise in the other areas. The children now have a little decrease, but we've made quite a compromise in the other areas. So I guess what my point out of that is be careful how much you muck around with the individual EBVs that you don't actually undermine the value of the index. But by just kicking out animals which are extreme for those economically important traits, so that the traits are really important to you, then you can make sure the breeding program is designed to go exactly in the direction that you want it to. Um, the other thing which I'll, I'll, I'll finish up on is the indexes don't, we don't ever express them that they should or will um, consider all the traits which are important to you when you make a selection decision or your selection criteria. So using the indexes in association with um, these other criteria is, is the recommended way forward. So there should never be any, any idea that you can just select on the index and not pay attention to these other important traits within your select or other selection criteria. And one of the possible ways to do that is to effectively identify the index of relevance to you based on what your breeding goals, use that in, or the index of most relevance to rank the animals, but then go through and start to disregard any animals with individual EBVs in, in your undesirable ranges and disregard any animals that, that aren't hitting your other selection criteria. Then you'll be left with, with animals with the right to their package, but also the, the head all these other boxes and be the most suitable animals for use within your breeding program. Um, last slide just to, to finish on um, is, is that, I guess, hopes to go through and, and explain what the review process was and what the, the changed indexes, what the, the new indexes are. Importantly, I guess, I really want to end up on saying well, that from us, from an Australian perspective, that's not the end of the road. It's possibly the, the beginning of the road and where we're going with the indexes. So there's, there's a number of other considerations which we have now moving forward, which, which Carl and the, the Brew Development Committee will be working on. So there's a new version of Brew Object uh, software, which we, we talked about before, known as Brew Object version 6. Agu is still recently working on that and, and they're making some further changes, so we, we hope that that would become available um, for consideration sometime, say, this year. Um, there's also a number of other considerations which we have going forward based on the feedback that we got from members with the indexes. So things that continually improve them, such as reviewing the units that we're producing them in, um, considering the move to reporting of sub-indexes, so maybe breaking the overall index down into indexes which are specific to different parts of the production system, be it the cow-calf production, the, the feedlot or background, or the, the kind of um, process of part of it, so you can break out where the different uh, superior is coming from, and also looking at and introducing or considering how we use accuracy values around the indexes as we do with the EBVs. So the, the, I guess the take home out of this is there's still a lot of work now going forward to consider about how we can continue to, to improve the indexes which are produced within our um, and, and that's where I'll finish it up.